Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we're continuing our hermeneutics series. Hermeneutics. That just sounds fun to say. It is a good word. (laughs) And Kevin, we're going to deal with a question that we have not tackled yet, but it really is a foundational one for kind of the practical application. I mean, so we've talked about the three principles of hermeneutics, the Christological principle, the other two that I'm blanking on. The Great coherence show prep. principle. An integrity principle. There you go. There, there we go. I, I, now I remembered it. And, you know, it's great, good background information. Okay, that's how we apply that. Or, you know, that's what they are. But we're going to get give you guys a question to ask that actually helps you begin practically applying this as you're reading through your Bible, as you're reading scripture. So, Kevin, what question is that? So the the primary question we want to ask as we as we open God's word and read God's word as we study God's word is the simple question of what is God doing? Wait, it's, wait, this is about God? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and it's it's no, no, one no, of those I'm reading, things I'm reading the Bible because I need to know how I'm supposed to live my life and what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. You're, you're exactly. kind of ruining my plan, dude. Right. And and this is this is kind of what we've been getting at in this entire approach to hermeneutics. And one of the reasons that, that we really thought this was an important topic to talk about for as many ever months as we keep doing this. Well is, it keeps the, it's when we don't even record during a month. Does yeah, that month it, count as part of the month? Somehow. But, okay. but hermeneutics is such an important question because it is the fundamental question of how do you read this word that we believe is given to us by God that we might know him? Mm. And there are so many suggestions and teachings about the Bible that really fail at the most basic hermeneutical level. So you are going to be encouraged by whether intentional or unintentional voices on the internet or in your daily life, in books, in radio broadcasts, in pod, definitely in podcasts, um, (laughs) and other things, even maybe pastors from certain pulpits will encourage you to read the Bible to get things out of the Bible that God never intended you to read the Bible in order to get. You, the the I'm, silly I'm examples. through that sentence. I'm right. pretty sure. The silly yeah. examples would be, we're going to read the Bible to find a healthy diet. Or, so, so I'm going to yeah. go looking through the Bible and say, well, they ate dates and leeks and melons and honey and, and milk and, you know, whatever. And so therefore, that's how God wants me to eat. To Dude, which we so, say, so you the read Daniel the wrong plan text. is not the Daniel plan is right. the thing. No, it's the John the Baptist plan. So you can only Ooh. eat honey and grasshoppers, um, and as you're dressed in camel's hair, <laughs> right? So, and that's exactly you're laughing because it's that silly. And, well, you also and the see like the, it's silly. There's like is, Garden of Eden ones where I'm yeah. seeing you're only supposed to eat grains and fruits, and they're actually going back to well, what did Adam and Eve eat? They were the first people God created. Here's what He gave them. Therefore, yeah, and that must the, be the best food that a human can eat. What Peter isn't telling you is he actually does subscribe to a biblical diet. Oh, yeah, the Genesis 9-3 diet. Yes, the Genesis 9 diet. Yeah, that's, which is, that's totally legit. I mean, yes. literally God says, take these things and eat them. Which things? All living things. Right, the things that walk Meat. on the earth. That's right. <laughs> so, so in Genesis 9, God actually says to Noah, eat meat and peter's like i found my passage so it is. but see that's the point if peter advocates a reading of scripture in which the real point of scripture is to tell us what to eat we should all tell him he's wrong he's fundamentally wrong and this is actually the very basic idea we're trying to get across is that when we open the bible we don't come to it with our agendas and we don't come to it and say I'm going to look in the Bible to find a diet. I'm going to look in the Bible to find the best way to parent. I'm going to look in the Bible to find um, how I should feel about COVID-19. I'm not going to look in the Bible to find out um, what Kevin should do in 2020. Or here, or maybe a more pious version of that, which is still the same error is here's what I'm struggling with today. What does God's word have to say about that? And I'm going to go do a word search for sorrow or grief or 
I'm, I'm coming to it, like you said, the point is I'm coming to it with here's what I believe I need to know. Mm-hmm. Here's the comfort that I believe I need. I'm going to go look for script, look at scripture until I find this thing that I believe I need. There's and a lot of I in there. There's a lot of I in that. And that's kind of the point is it's just, it's a very basic idea that I encourage everyone to think through is that when we open the Bible, it is a sacred text. Sacred is a fancy word for holy. It's right mm-hmm. on the front of most people's Bibles. It says holy Bible on it. And those words, holy, sacred, scripture, all those words that are kind of in our in our parlance, kind of God type words, reminds us that this is God's word. And we should read it with that very basic understanding that this book is about God. It's about God and especially what he does, what he Mm -hmm. has done, what he has done specifically in Christ, and what he promises to do because of his action in Christ. And that then drives us, when we open the scriptures, we're not going through the passage to see where I fit into this reading or how I feel about these things or how this applies to my life today or even how it applies to my situation today. Instead, we are opening the scriptures in order to see God. We're opening the scriptures in order to learn what God is doing, what he has done, what he promises to do, what he has done throughout history, how Mm. does he save his people, how does he interact with his people, what does he do when his people don't live up to his commandments? That's a big question too. What is God doing? That's the question we wanna answer. What is God doing? So when I open the Bible, even devotionally, I know some people say when you open the Bible devotionally, it's different than studying it, and devotion is kind of more subjective where studying is more objective. I understand the point, but I still think the subjectivity of devotional reading should still be the subject should be God. Yeah. What <laughs> is God doing? It's still subject to right. him, not what my own desires. It, how does this scripture, passage, book, psalm, couple verses, whatever it is, what does it teach me about God? Hmm. That's what we're really trying to get at is let's make sure the goal of our reading is God. And then when we when we get that understanding then you understand why we said the center of it all is christ because when we ask the question about god the answer is always going to be in its fullness in christ in jesus christ as god's definitive action to save mankind yep. right yeah. that is going to drive us to the to the answer of who is god and what is he doing all these questions about god we're going to finally find the answer most fully in Jesus. And remember, we're Lutherans, so we say we got to do law gospel in all this. Well, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> because the law reminds us that God condemns sin and sinners. That's throughout the scriptures. What does God do? Well, when his people mess up, he condemns them. He judges them, he tells them they're wrong, he punishes them, right? And, and they die frequently too. Right, and that's that's so yeah. serious that it, it actually means death. Yeah. According to God's own word. And then you say, well, is there any good news? And the answer is, yes, there is. Because God rejoices to forgive sins. And in Jesus Christ, God has paid the penalty of sin in his death, and he has forgiven the sins of all those who are in Christ now, so that those of us who are in Christ Jesus because of God's good work of sending his son and giving us faith in his son, we now exist as sinners who have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. And we receive his life instead of the death that our sins deserve. And, and See, even that approach to our status before God is part of the question of what is God doing? Yes, it's, it's it's even there. It's not a place where we can jump in and say, "Well, well, what do I do?" No, the proper question is still, "What is God doing to us, right. with us, in us?" All of that. It's it's still <laughs> the action is still flowing the same direction. Right. So so that's exactly right. And these are these are some giant principles that I know um, some people have said to me. Yeah, that's all well. That's all well and good. That's kind of a thirty thousand foot view. But I need to understand how to read the Bible itself, like how to read this passage. And and I encourage you to not jump 
quickly to that idea because this actually isn't just a large view. This actually does help individual passages. Yeah, th this is actually going to clarify as you're reading chapter and verse mm -hmm. in Scripture and lead you away from the major pitfalls we talked about at the beginning. Right. So, Kevin, what are your Goliaths that you need to conquer? Yeah, exactly. With your, what are the and giants And where are your, your five stones that you need to find to help you conquer those giants? Yeah, and, and so one of the easiest passages to pick on is David and Goliath. One, because it's so commonly and well-known, obviously. Yeah, and because everybody uses that one in that yeah, way. Yeah, and then the other one is because... <laughs> Basically, misinterpretations are, are extremely popular and, and common of that one. So, as Peter is alluding to, a lot of people will say, oh, David slew Goliath. Um, he did so trusting in the strength of the Lord, which we would agree with. That's what the story says. And yeah. That's what David did. And they say, therefore, you are to be like David. And we would say, okay, yes, I am to believe in God like David. He is an, he is a saint and therefore he is an example to all of us to put our faith and our hope in God. Yeah, no I, I am to trust that. God in the same way David trusted God. Yes, I am to look to Yahweh who is who is Christ our Lord for my help, right? Absolutely. And then they say and and he trusted in God by killing a giant with five smooth stones. So now you metaphorically have giants in your life. What are they? Or, or they say because he trusted in God, he was able right. to kill the giant. Therefore, you need to get enough trust in God so that you can go kill your giants. It's still the same metaphor, but right. just kind of taking you do it, it right? in a different direction there. And, and the issue is what we have just done is we've actually thrown away the entire narrative of Scripture and made the actual narrative of Scripture my life. Yeah, as opposed because, to our big question, which is, what is God doing? Right. What is We've God doing? We've taken the entire thing is now, what should I do? Or and we start with that. It's what should I do, or how is God going to react to my situation, which is equally bad? Or how can I get God? Yeah, and, and then to react yeah, to my we situation start manipulating yeah. him because we want yeah. him to act the way that I think he should act, which is another major problem. <laughs> yeah, here's um, my giants. God, go slay yeah, them. You must slay them. And it's here's like, your well, stones. I've even provided you the stones. You didn't read the rest of the Old Testament because he doesn't always defeat Israel's enemies. But that's exactly the point. What I just said yeah, is actually yeah. part of the point. I just read David as representative, not of me, but of Israel. And this is something that we we're, we want to talk about just real briefly the rest of our time together is that when you start reading scripture as what is God up to? What has he done? What has he done in Christ? What does he promise to do? What you start seeing is that this is actually the story of scripture. The story of scripture is God acting. Mm -hmm. That's it. This is a story of scripture, God acting. So he does stuff, right? Right at the beginning. In the beginning, God did something. That's how it starts, right? In the beginning, what did God do? He created. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then chapter two, what did God do? He put the man and the woman in the garden. Right? Chapter yep. three, what did he do? He kicked them out. He showed up because they had messed <laughs> up, and he judges them and kicks them out. Yep. Right? And, and all of a sudden, what you see is, is now God's activity intersects with man's activity already in Genesis chapter three. And when man's activity is actually driving the ship contrary to God's activity, there's problems. Well, okay, let's, let's back up a little bit because Kevin, you did something that we don't advocate that people do when they're reading scripture and you went to Genesis first. Right. Let's actually go to your favorite book, John, because John chapter one is actually a fantastic exposition of here's God acting and here's God doing in that chapter. The entire chapter is God, 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 God acting, doing like the whole thing is kind of just this summary of here's, here's what he is doing and what he's going to do. And, and all of that, I can see from your face since we're on video that I just threw you for a loop, but I think no, it's a didn't. good loop. You, you I, I think it's, it's exactly where I was going to go next. So you're exactly okay. right. That's exactly. Oh, where so I, was I jumped going. ahead of you. Yep. 
So, I'm thinking of this because the last one of the last times we talked about this in this kind of depth was way back at the beginning, episode 14, where we laid out our Bible yeah. reading plan. And so that, that's kind of like my mind is going back to that. And I'm like, why did Kevin go to Genesis? And John and is exactly actually a fantastic right. example because, for this. <laughs> because what you find out, and, and this is where I was getting at in this, and you're exactly right, Peter. I totally agree with what, everything you just said. It even accused me of jumping the wrong direction. That's right. That's why I did it. Because... <laughs> My point is, when we start in Genesis and read the history of the Old Testament, what we're going to always be tempted to do is to misread the Old Testament. So now just stick with us here, because we've been saying this, but I'm going to say it again. The Old Testament is the true word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. There are no errors in it. Yeah. It makes sense as it's written. When Moses wrote the Torah... That was God's inspired word, and it still is today. We're not denigrating it at all. Right. But we are people who live now after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we read the Old Testament, the New Testament authors teach us to read the Old Testament as those things that are fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So what we want to do is we want to say we are going to start our reading with the activity of God to save his people in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And now that we understand that activity of God to save, we can properly read the Old Testament as explaining God's activity to save his people leading up to his work in Jesus Christ. So. When we look at the Bible as God's activity, my point is, is that God is active in the Old Testament. God is active in the New Testament. This is a unifying way to read the scriptures, right? Go ahead. Yeah, well, I just want to say, I want to go jump back to Genesis 4 just to see if I'm getting this, because I think I've made a couple connections here, so tell me if I have accurately made the connections, particularly in in what we've been doing in the hermeneutic series. So I kind of want to tie a couple things together that we've had in previous episodes. So we did an episode on what is and is not the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know the the headings and even the verse divisions and all those various things that aren't actually part of the original text itself, their editorial decisions. So Genesis four, you went up through three. So I'm going to jump to Genesis four, which I know yep. is Cain and Abel. Right. Well. The heading tells me Cain and Abel, and it's the story about them. So right off the bat, the editorial decisions are working against me being able to read this as what is God doing. And then the way the narrative starts is here's a story of Cain and Abel and doing their thing, and then God shows up later. So this is clearly a story about them because they're the first characters that show up in the verse division, the chapter division, all of that. The point being, if we're trying to read this intentionally about what is God doing, we do actually have to work at that. Yeah, it's it, it's, it's not exactly just right. a. <laughs> but it's it, not only is our sinful nature working against us because we want to make it about us, but this is why we dedicated an entire episode to look that the headings can be helpful, the verse divisions, chapter divisions can be helpful, but we want you to know, don't get freaked out by recognizing those aren't actually part of God's word. Right. And right here is actually one of the reasons we wanted to make that point. Because if you're going to ask this big question, so many of those headings don't help you answer that question. Yeah, <laughs> They exactly. kind of lead you in a different direction. Um, remember, and I'll just, I'll just say this just to kind of review some of that, but also to give a little encouragement, is that we're not denigrating the subheadings. Um, the yeah. subheadings are often a quick way to scan through a book to, to trace kind of the characters and who's doing what. They, and they that, help, and that they help you remember help the structure context. of the book. Right. Yeah, so it's like, say, oh, that's, that's right. where that, yeah, it goes that's where that is. here, and then it goes Noah and the Flood, and then it goes Tower of Babel, and then it, you know, yeah, and subheads sometimes are an easy way to skim through a book to remember the flow of the, of the story, the context, who's doing what, maybe sometimes even when, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but when you're asking this question, which we right. believe is one of the most important ones, they're less helpful. 
Right. And they are, they are actually it's, sometimes it's worthwhile to recognize yeah. that <laughs> it, it, it very much. And that's, that's a point well, well made. Um, so let's get back to this. So, yeah. So the idea is that what we want to do then is we want to see, and I'll just concentrate on the old Testament because it's kind of harder to do this sometimes in the old Testament. We want to see the scriptures as what is God doing? So the story of the old Testament, because we know that it is fulfilled in the, in the, definitive action of God to save mankind through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because we know that's the goal of it. We actually go back and we read it seeing God working to save his people. Yeah. That actually becomes the narrative thread that ties it all together. God is working to save his people. Now, just like we said before, there is both law and gospel in that statement because the law comes in and says his people need saving. There's something that people have done wrong. God must intervene to save them. If nothing was going on that was wrong, then God wouldn't need to intervene anything. He would just be God. Yeah. And the fact that the narrative is actually God's action to, to save his people really points to the fact that God's people need a savior. They need saving. And this is part of the narrative of the Old Testament is that God is doing good things for his people. He's providing for them. He's he's making promises to them. And his people receive those promises and receive those good things, but don't always follow through correctly. They don't always live correctly. They don't always believe correctly. And and this is what we see in the Old Testament then is, is God's activity to save his people involves his dwelling with his people. This is one of the major ideas of the Old Testament is that God's going to dwell with his people. And the mm. idea of God's dwelling with his people is actually the kingdom of God. If you just want to say kind of generic thing, it's the kingdom of God. That's that's the term that Jesus likes to use to talk about God dwelling with His people. So it's the term that we're hey, going Matthew, to use. Matthew Matthew and five is live now. We have an entire video on that about much. Matthew yeah. going through that that very theme. That's exactly so God, right. God with us. So head over to our YouTube channel or Facebook, look for Matthew and five, and you can see an entire. Well, it's longer than five minutes, but you know it happens. The actual Matthew part is basically five minutes. Yeah, there you go. So, David just read it slower. <laughs> right, exactly. So remember, and, and remember, as we talk about the Gospel of Matthew, if if you're trying to figure out how to read the Old Testament, Matthew is a good place to start. He's yeah. gonna, he's going to do a lot of don't forget this is what it said in the Old Testament moves in his Gospel. Right, he likes to do that. He likes to say Jesus did this. Oh yeah, don't forget that's a fulfillment of the Old Testament passage that says this, or yeah. the prophet who said that, or the circumstance in which this happened. So. Don't forget that Matthew is always a very helpful guide for reading the Old Testament, as is the book of Hebrews. Yep. Um, I would say John, of course, but but it, <laughs> but when you're just talking about Matthew, that that is one of the the real um, helpful things that the Gospel of Matthew can do for us is to to help us read the Old Testament as explicitly he, he's, fulfilled. He's in all the about the of kingdom Christ. of heaven and God yeah, with us. God. So well, so that's, what we look at is the kingdom of God, even in the Old Testament, is God dwelling with his people. And so you think obviously about Garden of Eden, all those kind of stuff where God is with his people in the garden, walking those kind of with things. Them. Yep. Walking with them. And then you think about things like Noah, where there's this very intimate connection with God and Noah. Right? Like mm -hmm. there just seems to be like there he's giving him directions how to build a boat. Noah's listening to him and and there's these specific promises god's even shutting the door and those kind of things yeah and, and it's, it's a different reality than what we kind of think about but then then it moves on and and the people are spread out and those kind of things tail tower of babel and then you get to abraham where god is once again very intimate with abraham they're friends right mm -hmm. abraham is a friend of god they're standing um, on a mountaintop looking around and talking about right, and, things. And seemingly talking, right? God's just, coming and having meals with him. Right. Very just hanging intimate. out. Yeah. Um, even Sarah and Abraham both laugh when God talks to him. That's not a good thing, but but it's that intimate. <laughs> In that actually, case, but yeah. <laughs> they're actually laughing and, and they're they're that close. Right. And it's this idea that God God dwells with his people and his promises. He God he dwells with his promised people. And and this is a great prophecy that keeps moving through the Old Testament. And then we get to the Exodus where God actually hears and sees the needs of his people in slavery. And he saves them out of that, that slavery, which is God's action to save. So again, what is God doing? He's saving his people. Mm -hmm. And then we get to Exodus 19 and God actually calls them his people and then spends the rest of the book of Exodus explaining that he's going to dwell in their midst. Yeah. Right. This and is here's what how I'm going to build to all this stuff that he wants 
Yes. While he dwells in their midst. Right. I'm going to dwell yeah. in your midst in a tabernacle. Here's how you build it. And then you yep. say, what? And he's like, I'll say it again. Right. And, I've and been a pillar of fire. Is. I've been this pillar of smoke. Now I'm going to go live in the box. Right. And I'm going to still be this kind of presence. Right. Yeah. And it's amazing. Glory. <laughs> and so we, then we find that. And then you say, well, what's the book of Leviticus all about? You say, well, this is what it looks like when God dwells in your midst. It, there, there's clean and unclean and there's common and holy. And those things got to get all sorted out when God is dwelling in our midst, right? You got to get all sorted out. And I find myself living as a sinner. I find myself, instead of being holy and, and clean, I end up being common and unclean. And hmm. that don't work when God is in my midst. I got yep. to get that cleansed, right? And we have sacrificial system. We have washings. We have all kinds of offerings, that kind of stuff, right? Now, real it's quick note on that, though. God is dwelling in our, in our midst. But that, that right there, so that's a good point. That looks like I need to act, not how is God acting when it right. comes to the, the cleanliness stuff. So let, let's just pause. How I'm going through Leviticus, it looks like a whole list of things I got to do because I'm the one acting here. Right, which how, is how why do I look at that question, and say how Peter, does God act? The question, Peter, is stop asking what you got to do and say I can't help it, <laughs> and say what is God doing. So <laughs> instead of saying the v- book of Leviticus says I'm unclean, so I've got to act. What I said is because I'm unclean, there's a sacrificial system. Hmm. See, because I'm unclean, God, God gives me uh, a way to be clean. Okay. He gives me a sacrificial system. He gives to his people, right? And so it's not really me because I'm not even an Israelite. But even in that, look how easy it is to just turn that back around. Well, and even you, I though. just did. I said me. I'm not actually an Israelite. <laughs> yeah. He didn't give to me. He gave to the Israelites, right? So, so what you're seeing is this narrative, and it goes through then. And so God's people then wander in the wilderness. God's with them in the tabernacle, but it's, but it's not the promised land. It's not, the, it's not where they're supposed to live yet, right? He, God mm-hmm. wants to live with them in the promised land right? That's the goal. So in Joshua, they finally get there. But the problem is there are people there who don't believe in God. They believe in different gods. And God's like, well, I'm not going to live with them. That's, we got that clean, unclean thing and the pure, unpure happening again. Let's, we got to get rid of the impure. What's God going to do? He's going to make sure the promised land is holy and clean. And, And this is the book of Joshua. And then in the book of Judges, what we find is that they start dwelling not with Yahweh as their king, but they start wanting to kind of have rulers. And hey, those guys you said were unclean, they look kind of nice. We kind of like them. And then, yeah. but then they oppress us. So help us. And God does, oddly enough, he sends judges. But then he, the result of all that yep. is they say, we want a king like those other nations. And God says, no, you don't. You don't want a king like your other nations. You want to be different because I'm your king. And then yeah. this leads to the rejection of Yahweh as king and the beginning of the monarchy, which is the rule of a king over Israel. And and again, the question is, what is God doing? Well, here's, here's the amazing thing in the Old Testament is God refuses to give up. He continues to have mercy and grace on his people. So even though re- the request for a king was really the rejection of Yahweh as king, what Yahweh says is, okay, I will give you a king and I will actually give you a king that is so great, great because he is a man after my own heart, that he will become a model for my actual activity to save mankind. And and it's not as if God was unprepared for this or yeah, unaware he, of this. So I don't know if we've talked about open theism at right, all here. We should, but we should let you we in gotta, on a we secret. Gotta, yeah. <laughs> God knew what was coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he already had this planned from the foundation, from the of, foundation the world. of the world. Yeah, it's so he's like, "Yep, yep, the things this things are gonna proceeding. Yep. This is how it's going. I'm acting the whole way, and I, I know I'm going to. I'm willing to. I love my creation, and I'm I'm going to do this, knowing and, completely what they're going to do. Yep. <laughs> and so David comes along, and the kingdom of God is established with an actual king on the earth and an actual land, and people think." 
oh, we we finally got it. This is it. This there is it the is. best it's going to get. We got David. We got a kingdom. We got actual land. We got the presence of God in our midst with the the Holy of Holy or the Ark of the Covenant. We've got, you know, the Davidic king, which is the the Messiah. We are good to go. We got God's kingdom on earth. Look at us. We've even got political borders that we can say, this is where God's kingdom is on the earth. And we're just so yep. happy. This is we awesome, can point right? To it. <laughs> and as soon as they, they start defining God's kingdom as a physical lo- location on earth as defined by David and his rule, David dies and Solomon takes over and they say, this is great because David's son also, is Also, David reign kept like doing things during his well, life that stop. weren't really... Just, just stop. David but was a man the... after God's own heart. We're not going to bring up those little, uh, but, you know... But, but the adultery and the, the murder... Oops. And, and the... the the other stuff see and what happens is then with all this effusive praise about david we say wait but he's still a sinner like all of us Mm -hmm. as a matter of fact he even prays and writes psalm 51 which is you know against you only have a son sinned and none was evil in your sight that's david right this is yeah. the manner for God's own heart, the messianic king, and yet he's falling before his on his face Who before God. Who starts by saying, "Create in me a clean heart." Right. Wait a minute. Wait. Your what? heart is after God's heart. How? So yeah, how does that work? Yeah. So then what happens is Solomon comes and he looks like. Here's the thing: Solomon's kingdom is actually richer than David's kingdom. He has more money. He's also wiser. And right, and he's wiser, and and he has more um, treaties with foreign nations. And so people think, oh, this is going really well. But actually what happens is with Solomon, the kingdom of God continues to become more like the world. Mm. False gods, treaties with other nations, riches start to become the, the measure of who they are. And after Solomon, the kingdom literally falls apart. It gets split in two. And then yep. both of those kingdoms actually go in exile because of their idolatry. So what's the question? What is God doing, right? What is God doing? We are now fully into law and gospel understanding of the Old Testament as a whole. Hmm. That God is always providing for his people. He is fulfilling his promise of kingdom and land and a Messiah, a savior. And in his people, when they disobey, he punishes them. Right? Yeah. But he's continually providing for them the means by which they can be forgiven. And that means especially as as david's kingdom reminds us is the word and so this actually follows through the rest of the old testament you read the prophets you read the stuff about the return of of, from exile all those things and it's always now after david's kingdom we're always trying to get the kingdom of god back yeah (laughs) how do we get back to that point and god's answer to david is i will build for you a house and this then leads us to the kingdom of God is now in your midst on the lips of Jesus. And the question is, how? And the hmm. answer is, in his incarnation, in his perfect life, in his death, and his resurrection, and in his second coming, the kingdom of God is in your midst. God was, God was always pointing forward to Christ, even as he's setting up David as king, even as he's setting up the Levitical laws and rules, as he's setting up his tabernacle. In all of that, he's saying, there's something greater coming. I'm not done yet. This isn't the fulfillment of it. So as God is acting in all those ways, his actions are also acting forward, pointing us to the completion of that. that Which is exactly what the New Testament authors say. Yeah, They look back and they're like, okay, so when Isaiah wrote this, which actually was about the exile and was about the kings in his day, there was a greater fulfillment coming. And Mm -hmm. that fulfillment is now in Christ. And when Malachi wrote this, yes, he was talking about, you know, the reconstituted Israel after the exile and and all those kind of things and and that they're going to face trials in the coming years, but there's a greater fulfillment and it's in Jesus Christ. And when Hosea wrote, yes, he was describing the condition of Israel, but guess what? There was a greater fulfillment and that fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. And that's what all the New Testament authors do. They even go back to the Torah and they say, yes, Moses was talking to the people as they were physically gonna go into the promised land, right? Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy. But Paul says, you know what? 
he was actually writing about Christ. It's it's not a replacement either. No. I think a lot of times some of these things get categorized as, as replacement theology. We get accused of 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 advocating for replacement theology. That's that's not what this is at all. I I understand how it can sound like mm-hmm. that if we don't properly distinguish or we don't properly explain what fulfillment is and what that looks like, especially if you come from a background where you, you haven't been taught that. That hasn't been a part of your theological upbringing. Um, no, this isn't replacement. This is the way it was supposed to be all along, what was leading towards all along. It, you can't – replacement implies that, like, the thing before wasn't actually the right thing. Mm-hmm. It's – then now you've got – now you've finally got the right thing. You've replaced it. It's like, no, no, no. Those things were all the right thing, but they weren't the full right thing. See, and that's and that's why the question is not what should have God been doing. <laughs> it's not like yeah. he was messing up until he got to Jesus. <laughs> no, he was actually saving his people and dwelling with them and working through this creation to bless his people. He was doing that in the entire Old Testament. What we're saying is the fullness of that is in the incarnation perfect life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the, full, that's the fullness of it. Just like now, when you read the New Testament after the Gospels, we're still going to read it and say, what's God doing? What did he do in Christ? What's he going to do in the second coming? What's he doing today? And the answer what he's doing today is he's coming to us in word and sacrament to forgive sins of those who are in Christ, right? To be with his people. How is he with his people? Kingdom of God. Where do I see kingdom of God? In the word. Where do I see that? When I hear the word, when I when I read the word, when I share the word, when I receive the holy sacraments where it, the word is active when I with eat the, the word. When I eat the word, when I'm <laughs> yeah. washed in the word as a, you know, back in the day for me. When I remember that washing, all those things, we say, there's the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's where Christ is. And that's where right? he promised to be, too. It's not just where he is. It's a, he said, I will be here. Yeah. Th- these are I, all his I promises. am present here. I promise I will be here for you. But but we don't just read the New Testament and say, oh, it's all hunky-dory now because the kingdom of God has come in Christ and, and you know life is all good. No, we read the New Testament and we go, you know what? In Paul's day, the church still received law. Paul wrote Hmm. to the churches, the believers in Jesus Christ, and said, you are doing these things and you need to stop. Well, we also read that and we say, I am a sinner who has also violated God's law. And I am told in God's word, what is God doing? God is coming to me with his law and saying, if you're not living according to my will, you are wrong. You are mm-hmm. a sinner. And he's saying, repent. Turn to Christ, trust in his death and resurrection, and receive forgiveness. Just like in the Old Testament, God comes to dwell in the midst of his people, holy and common, clean and unclean. Sinners are not holy. We are not clean. It's only in the blood of Christ that we are washed clean and called to be holy, his very saints, not because of our righteousness, but because of his. That's what God is doing. And he's and he's still doing it today. That's the crucial conversation. That's why we do this podcast. Yep. <laughs> so, Kevin, where, where do you think we're going to go next with our, our next episode? I, I ask because... A couple nights ago, you and I had a brief conversation. My son wants mm-hmm. to start reading through the Bible, and we, I said, you know, what questions can he be asking in order to read the Bible as he's doing it for the first time? He's, he's 13 years old, wants to read all the way through it for the first time, and I want him to read it this way from the get-go mm-hmm. and to not have to break down you know, bad habits or, or this. And this was – what is God doing was, was the first question – you said mm-hmm. he should ask. We, we've got other questions. Are we going to cover those ones in future episodes? Are we going to start getting into some parables? What, what are we thinking here? I think, I think what we should do now is we spent a lot of time talking about reading the Bible. I think we should actually do it. All right. So cool. I, think it's, I think it's time for us to open the scriptures. We're going to look at some, some passages that are sometimes difficult to, to maintain this kind of a focus on. 
Mm-hmm. Um, usually those are, are parables are tough things to do, kind of like we did with, uh, with David and Goliath. We'll look at some New Testament parables. Not that David and Goliath is a parable. We weren't no, saying that. <laughs> but, but just the, the misinterpretation idea. Yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. prone to mis, yep. misread it. So I think, I think we should look at some parables. I think we should look at um, some passages of Scripture itself where um, this kind of a focus in reading helps us to read these texts in a Christological way with, with coherence and integrity. So our listeners, if, if you've got some passages that, you, that come to mind where you have a hard time reading them in this way, and maybe this is a new way of reading for you, maybe you're already familiar with reading Scripture in this way and you've made it a habit of your own already, but there may be some passages where you're like, oh yeah, this, this is really hard. We'd love to hear about that, uh, but not necessarily that will make them a podcast episode, but they might make an appearance. We'd love to at least get your feedback on that. You can always email us, questions at crucialproductions.org. You can go to our website, crucialproductions.org, fill out the form at the top. There's a ask a question button. You can fill it out, send them in that way. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. This, vid, this podcast will be up on YouTube. You can put them down in the comments in the YouTube channel. There's any number of ways you can uh, get in touch with us and send in those questions or comments on this. We do have questions that have come in that we haven't been able to get to yet, mainly because we're going through the hermeneutic series and we don't want to completely lose, lose track on that, but we will get to the questions that have come in. We're not ignoring you. <laughs> if you've sent something in and we haven't addressed it on the podcast, uh, we're not ignoring you. We're just trying to keep our flow going with the hermeneutic series, uh, which is why I'm saying, hey, if you got a question about this, that'll be a lot easier for us to get to uh, on the podcast. And if you appreciate what we do here on Crucial Productions with the podcast, with the Bible in five, uh, we We'd appreciate your financial support. Crucialproductions.org slash give is where you can go to do that. We're at the end of the year now. I know a lot of people are considering end of the year giving, and uh, this is a time when you're thinking about that. We are a registered nonprofit uh, with the U.S. government. We're a recognized service organization with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So I, if, if that means anything to you, yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's helpful. But we would appreciate your support after You've supported your local congregation, the church where you're a member. We always want to make sure that you're giving there first. That's the important one. And anything to a ministry like us, an outreach like us, would be extra on top of that. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, Kevin? No, uh, just read the Word. Read the Word, and and if you encounter passages you don't quite understand or or make you think, then... um, Call your pastor and ask him if to, to have a conversation about it. And, and if you want to ask us some questions, we'd be happy to discuss it as well. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys next time. See ya.